we're going to read from James chapter 4, verse 1 through to 12. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Let's pray before we come to those words. Scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. This morning, God in heaven, please give us humility, to hear and receive what you have to say to us, we pray. Amen. When did you last have a quarrel, a fight, an argument? Depending on your personality type and the personality type of the person it was with, it might have been a full-blown shouting match. It might just have been tense and silent for a while. How long ago was that? What caused it? Can you remember? If you can remember what caused it, I imagine that you've done one of the following two things. Either the other person caused it, or an external circumstance caused it. That's our natural default, isn't it? And sure, there's an element of truth in that. If that particular thing hadn't happened, maybe the argument wouldn't have happened. If the other person wasn't there, you're unlikely to have argued against yourself. But ultimately, James wants us to see this morning, that is a surface level answer to the question. To just say it's their fault or it's due to that thing that happened. James wants to show us the underlying answer. Let me give you an example. Maybe this rings bells for you. You get home after a long day at work full of stressful meetings. All you want is some peace and quiet. All you want is time by yourself, some silence to process the day. But there's someone else at home. Or if there isn't someone else at home, maybe a family member video calls you at just that moment. Their day hasn't been anything like yours. Their day has felt lonely and isolating. All they want is to talk to someone, to feel engaged with, loved, noticed. They start a conversation with you. It's not what you want it to happen. That conversation begins fairly mundane and it's kind of fine. And then they share with you something from their day, something that's been on their mind something they want to have a long conversation about. Your face drops. You make clear in your facial expressions, now is not the time. How inconsiderate could you be? Do you not see how tired I am? I just want some peace and quiet. But they want to talk, so they press on. The first words that come out of your mouth are quite sharp, because you want the problem to end. You want it to go away. 
your sharp words are met with an unkind response. Don't you care about me? What I'm going through? And so the fight, the quarrel, starts. I wonder if you can identify with that scenario. I wonder which one of the two you're more likely to be in that scenario. What caused that fight? Well, ultimately, it was a clash of desires, wasn't it? One person wants silence, peace, quiet, calm, comfort. The other wants engagement, attention, to feel heard, to be noticed. Two different desires clashing against one another. And so the quarrel starts. Yes, there was a surface level trickle. Well, they, they could have not brought it up until later. It wasn't the time. But ultimately, what caused that argument is a clash of two different people's desires. Two clashing desires leads to arguments. That's what James tells us, verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Not from external circumstances, not solely from the other person. Your desires, that battle within you. He goes on to say, verse 2, you desire, but you do not have. You don't get what you want in that situation, so you kill. Not literally, but you are willing in that argument to harm the other person, to start a war of words. Because when our desires are hindered, trampled on, we're willing to fight to get what we want. James actually reminds us as an aside that there's a better way to get what we want. It's to ask God. If it's a genuinely good desire, if we're wanting a good thing for his glory, ask God and he will give it. But his big point is this. Arguments come from the desires that rage within you. If James was running a kind of conflict management workshop, or he was kind of doing secular counselling for a married couple who are arguing quite a lot, he'd probably stop there and say, OK, we've seen the problem. The problem is that you've got desires that clash with one another, so you just need to control your desires a bit better. You, you know, sometimes let that person's desire win, sometimes let that person's desire win. Just control yourself and the problem will go away. James doesn't stop there. James isn't satisfied with that kind of resolution approach because he knows that will not ultimately work. It works for a time, but it doesn't ultimately work because we act on our desires because of a more problematic reality that sits under the surface. That's what he goes on to show us. Here's the first thing then we're going to see this morning, the reality, divided loyalty. Verse 4 starts, you adulterous people. There are few things in our world more painful than adultery. That person you trusted, that person you gave all of yourself to, that person takes the intimate relationship you have given them and exchanges it for another. It's awful. It is incredibly painful. You might know something of that personally, whether it's you directly who's been impacted by that, or whether you've kind of seen its ripples in your extended family. Adultery is a horrible thing. And yet, verse 4, that is what James calls his hearers adulterous people. He's speaking to Christians, and this is what he calls them. He is not saying that because every one of them has had an affair. James isn't concerned at this juncture with physical adultery. No, James's issue is spiritual adultery. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. What's James's point? You, you can't have both. You're trying to have both God and the world, and you can't. Pledging your allegiance to God, loving the world on the side. Saying you're all in for Christ, while flirting with what the world has to offer. James saying, don't do that. It's spiritual adultery. It's not just a random image that James has chosen to use. 
Now, James is tapping into a rich Old Testament theme for us. Again and again, God describes himself as the bridegroom. Again and again, Israel, his people, are described as the bride. And yet, again and again, throughout the Old Testament, his bride are unfaithful to him. You see that through the prophets. There's a little footnote in our passage that reminds us that this is an allusion to covenant unfaithfulness, breaking the promise that God has made with his people. You see it throughout the prophets, particularly in Hosea. See, James is saying, we are just like they were. It's not okay to look back at the Old Testament and go, Israel was just so stupid. What were they doing? I would never do that. We are like them. Professing allegiance to God, and yet on the side, dabbling with the pleasures of the world. And just as a spouse rightly expects the full devotion of their spouse, so God rightly expects our full devotion. Just as a spouse is rightly jealous if they catch their spouse flirting with another, so within God a right jealousy is provoked when he sees us flirting with the world. A perfect, holy jealousy. See, God has won us at deep personal cost. His son bled to death to make us his bride. God longs for our undivided loyalty. And yet I imagine all of us, if we were honest this morning, would admit we do not give God our undivided loyalty. So James calls us adulterers. Language that none of us will like this morning. It might prompt in us a couple of different reactions. It might prompt in us shame as we realize this is what we are like. Despair, we're beyond the pale. God looks at me, he diagnoses me right, so he can't love me anymore. Or maybe it prompts in us defensiveness. I'm not that bad. Yeah, I'm not perfect, but I'm doing a pretty good job. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not an enemy of God. James does have good news to give us this morning. But that good news won't do anything for us until we see and accept the bad news. The reality that we are those who have a divided loyalty, who time after time choose friendship with the world, judging our standard of living by the world's way of living, shaping our ambitions with the ambitions that the world gives us, spending our days and our nights running after temporary pleasures, because waiting for God to satisfy that need takes too long. We are disloyal people, God says, James says, split between following the Lord and following the world. It is to that kind of person that James has good news to give us. If you've heard that and gone, that's me. I'm an adulterer, I'm divided, I'm not perfectly loyal to the Lord. He has good news for you, verse 6. God gives us more grace. Notice he doesn't give grace to those who are proud, to those who push this diagnosis away, who say they're basically doing all right, they're not perfect, but they're pretty much sorted. He doesn't give grace to those kind of people. But he gives grace, he shows favour to the humble He shows it to the lowly. He shows it to those who know how short they fall. You see, the God who gives, that's what we've been seeing through James, God is the God who gives. The God who gives, again, meets us in our failings. He gives what we need. He gives grace. As I was reading around this this week, one author really helped me as he talked about the gravity of grace. Not the kind of seriousness, but the weightiness. See, the way grace works with God is it goes down and down and down and down and down. It's under the impact of gravity, so to speak. It goes down until it finds the lowest. And when it gets to the lowest, that is where it gets to work. God shows grace to the humble. The reality is we have divided loyalty. And yet God shows grace to those 
who are humble. What's the response to be this morning? It's the second thing we're going to see. Humble yourselves. The obvious implication, if God shows grace to the humble, humble yourselves. He exposed the problem for us. Verses 1 to 6. And then in verse 7, he completely shifts how he's speaking. I don't know if you noticed it as it was being read. It was a very stark change. Verses 1 to 6 is full of rhetorical questions and answers that follow. And then in verse 7, it's just command, 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 command. Let me just read it, hear it. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. In the space of four verses, five verses, ten commands. What is James doing? Has he just run out of patience? After kind of three and a half chapters, has he finally just snapped? And he's just reeling off a bunch of things to do. No, so James says carefully, we these together. They are all working together. They are all distinct angles on the same one thing. The one thing James really wants to communicate to us this morning. Summarised by verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. What's the response James wants this morning? That we humble ourselves. That we repent. Real repentance. Heartfelt, emotionally weighty repentance. Not a kind of light, breezy recognition that we're not perfect, that we could do a little bit better, but also not really seeing it as that serious. No, instead, he wants us to see our need of repentance. He wants us to be drawn to repent. Let's take each of them in turn. First, he calls us to submit ourselves to God. That is, we are to recognize that God is ultimate and we are not. We are to bow the metaphorical knee before the Lord. We are to accept that he and he only has rights over us. Second, we're to resist the devil. Because saying yes to God does mean saying no to his enemy. Saying no to the devil's lies. Turning our backs on the devil. We're promised that means he will flee from us. Not that if we resist him hard enough, we're guaranteed perfection in this life or a trouble-free life, not a promise of total victory. But for those who resist the devil, there will be some semblance of winning in the now. We are to come near to God. Submitting is kind of bowing the knee before the Lord. Resisting the the devil is turning our backs on the devil. Now we're to to where we are to move towards, or to move towards the Lord. And in doing so, moving away from the devil and the world knowing that as we move towards the Lord, he comes near to us. We are to wash our hands. That is, we are to change our outward actions. Because it's not good enough to just say we're repentant. Our behavior needs to change as well. We're to purify our hearts. Because behavior change alone isn't sufficient. A divided heart will flow out into action eventually. So we are to purge our heart of its friendship with the world. We are to increasingly fill our hearts with the pure wisdom that comes from above. Verse 9, we are to grieve, mourn, and wail. Because intellectual repentance isn't enough. It's not, just, it's not enough just to say, I know I've done wrong things. Now, whether or not there's actual tears, whether there's wailing, That'll kind of depend on who you are and how you're made. But a purely theoretical understanding of falling short is not enough, God says. It's not the same as genuine repentance. Repentance that feels the weight of what we've done. James says, change your laughter to to mourning and your joy to gloom. What he's not calling for is church to just be a really glum place to be. Like we're supposed to be a kind of convention of Eeyores, constantly mourning and gloomy all the time. Laughter and joy amongst God's people isn't wrong. We know that, obviously, because we're told to rejoice always. 
The problem that James is addressing is laughing and joy over sin. See, sin shouldn't be funny to us. Sin should grieve us. Sometimes when we gather, there should be an air for a, for a few moments of gloom as we confess the weightiness of our sin before the Lord. And finally, verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. For those who humble themselves, that is a wonderful promise. He will lift you up. Grace has a gravity to it. It always goes down to the lowest. Grace also has an anti-gravity to it because it lifts the lowest up. It lifts them to the Lord. God loves lifting people out of the pit. He loves reversing the order of this world that says the low stay low and the high stay high. Now in God's economy, the humble are lifted up. This morning, you might feel in the pits. You might be feeling the weight of your sin, feeling too far gone from the Lord, feeling utterly inadequate, feeling undeserving of anything from him. That is exact, exactly where God wants you this morning. That is where God promises he will meet you this morning. God gives more grace. Grace to the humble. He will lift you up. As long as you don't push James's understanding of the problem away. If you look at James's diagnosis of our hearts and say that's just over the top, or it might be true, but it's damaging to our self-esteem, so we need to not talk about it very much. We won't be able to receive this kind of grace. Instead, as we let James's diagnosis humble us, as we let it cause heartfelt repentance within us before the Lord, it is there that the Lord will meet us. Because God gives more grace. Maybe this morning you wouldn't call yourself a Christian. You have no kind of experience of this. Might be that you are a Christian and you've experienced this kind of weightiness and mourning over your sin many times before. And again this morning you're feeling how short you fall. Either way, God's answer is the same. Humble yourselves before me. Because there is where grace is found. Grace that is achieved through the cross as Jesus hangs and dies for us, paying our penalty, paying for this sin, for this divided loyalty. Grace is given from above to all of those who humble themselves. It lifts us out of the pit. And then there's one more thing that James wants us to know about this kind of grace. It transforms us. It will change us. It will deal with the problem that our passage started with. Here's the third thing then this morning, the result. Not speaking against one another. Our passage started with fights and quarrels. Fights and quarrels caused by the battles that rage within each of us. The ultimate cause was the divided loyalty of our hearts. James showed us that the response is to humble ourselves, relying on the Lord to give grace that lifts us up. And now that that is in place, we can come back to the issue of fights and quarrels. We can deal with the way we speak, which is an issue for us. James says, verse 11, do not slander one another. Or other translations say, do not speak against one another, which I think is a better way of going. Because the problem with saying, don't slander one another, is we, we come up with a defense mechanism. I wonder if you've ever done this. Okay, I'm not supposed to slander people, but what I'm saying is true. So that means it's not slander. So that means I'm off the hook. As you know, what James says is, do not speak against your brothers and sisters. It may well be true what you're saying, but it's not sufficient grounds for saying it. One writer speaking on this passage says that there are few commands that go against commonly accepted wisdom more than this. The rest of the quote will come up on the screen because that's as much as I can remember. There we go. Most people think it's okay to convey negative information if that information is true. We think like that, don't we? It's okay to convey negative information as long as it's true. 
We saw two weeks ago how quick we are to speak ill of others. James is saying, actually, when it comes to our brothers and sisters in Christ, it's not okay to speak against someone just because it's true. Even if they're in the wrong, even if they've done wrong, it doesn't justify the kind of speech that speaks against them. Do not speak against one another, James says. Um, At this point, there's an important caveat to make. Because verses like verse 11, brothers and sisters do not speak against one another, are used by some appallingly to keep abuse silent in the church. Because they go to verse like this and say, well, you can't report abuse in the church because you're speaking against someone. Let me be really clear, that is not what this verse is about. It is not okay to use this verse to silence victims. It is right and good to report safeguarding failures when they appear. If you want to work through with me how that works and how that fits with this verse, do come and grab me later. What this verse is, though, is a call to not freely speak against other believers. Not under the guise of a prayer request. That person really needs our prayers because they're struggling with this sin at the moment, I can just tell. Not under the guise of, I think you should just be aware that, dot, dot, dot. Why does James say this is so wrong? Well, he tells us anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. The law that back in chapter 2 is love your neighbor as yourself. See, it is the opposite of the response James is looking for. The response James wants is humility. Humility that submits itself before the Lord. What does this do? It's it's in judgment over the law that the Lord has given. It is the opposite response. When we speak against others, that is not humility worked out in our speech. It is the opposite. It is our divided loyalty worked out in our speech. We are then to love our brothers and sisters, to love our neighbours as ourselves, not speaking ill of them, but speaking of them in light of how God has treated them. How has God treated our brothers and sisters? The same way he's treated us. He has lavished grace upon us. Verse 6, he gave us more grace. He gave them more grace. The question is not, will Christian communities experience conflict? They will. It happens. Because we are people with divided loyalties, who often prioritise their own desires over the desires of others. A clash forms, conflict starts. Those conflicts will happen because there is an inherent issue that sits in our hearts. An adulterous dividedness, a split loyalty between God and the world, an attempt to be friends with both God and the world. The question is not, will there be conflict in Christian communities? The question is, how will the community respond when the conflict comes? How will you respond when you are part of that conflict? Will we dig our heels in? Stand on our desires and our rights? Or will we humble ourselves? Knowing that those who humble themselves before the Lord are not left in a pit of despair. Because we're told that in the pit, God meets us. He gives more grace. He gives grace to the humble. So this morning, brothers and sisters, we are going to humble ourselves before the Lord. Recognise how far short we fall. Feel the weight of that reality. Because for those who do that, God will lift us up. That's the promise of verse 10. And as those who then are lifted up, let's aspire to use our tongues well, not to speak ill of others, but humbly submitting ourselves to God and to his call to love our neighbours as ourselves. In light of those words, we're going to spend some time praying together. I'm going to lead us in the kind of corporate confession of the ways we fall short in the light of these words, and then we'll sing to close. Let me lead us in prayer. What causes fights and quarrels among you? 
Don't they come from your desires, that battle within you? Father, we read those words and we know that our desires are not what they should be. We know often we desire the things of this world, the things that we want that are not best for us and that harm others. And not only do we desire those things, but we indulge those things to the detriment of others, causing fights and quarrels. And we are sorry. We recognise this morning that we are adulterous people, people who are trying to have friendship with the world and friendship with you. And we know it's not possible. We know that Jesus said you can only serve one master. We're sorry for the way that we pledge allegiance to you and yet run after other things. Things that offer us pleasure in the here and now, instant satisfaction, getting our way, doing what we want, rather than doing what is right. We recognise that we want the blessings that come from you, but we're not often willing to commit ourselves wholly to you. And for that we are sorry. We recognise that these words are a description of what we are like. Those with divided loyalties. And we are sorry and repent before you. We come to you on our knees, submitting ourselves before you and ask that you would help us. Would you help us to resist the devil and his lies? Lies that are so enticing and easy to fall into. As we come near to you, would you in grace this morning come near to us? You promised that you will, and so, Father, we ask that you will act in line with your promises. Father, we can't wash ourselves and purify ourselves in our own strength, and so, Father, please do that work by your Spirit. Please purify our hearts that we would no longer be double-minded, but instead whole, mature, perfect, complete. Father, please, would you cause in us heartfelt repentance that causes us to grieve and mourn and wail over the weight of our sin, that will cause us not to laugh and joke about sin, but to mourn over it, to feel a sense of gloom over it. Ultimately this morning, Father, we pray you would help us to humble ourselves before you. Father, we're sorry for the way that we partially repent so much of the time, recognising what we do is wrong, but not feeling the weight of it, not seeing the significance of the the desires that sit beneath our acts. The way that we intellectually understand that we have done wrong, but there is no heartfelt response in us. We are sorry for that. We recognise that the kind of deep conviction that we are, that we need, only comes from the Spirit who brings judgment and conviction and righteousness. And so, Father, we pray that you would be at work in us by your Spirit. Please, this morning, Spirit, would you convict us of our sin? Would we feel the weight of it? And would that humble us, we pray? From that place of being humbled, would we know the grace that lifts up the humble? Would that cause us to change this morning? Would you transform us by your grace? That we increasingly become those who do not speak against one another, but also live pure, holy, undivided lives to your glory. Amen.